my name is uh, Mark Abumeri here. I'm a uh, partner with the law firm of Kenobi Martins. If you are not familiar with our firm, we are uh, probably second or third largest firm, IP firm in the US. We have nearly 300 IP lawyers that do nothing but intellectual property law. So we are not attorneys, but we are really experts in the field of intellectual property law. So if you ever need any services, do call on us. Uh, well, we're here tonight to uh, talk about a very interesting and exciting topic, at least for me, and there's a lot to cover, so we do want to get started. I'm going to introduce the moderator, Commander David Place, who will take it from here. So do we have any fortune tellers in the audience? Uh, oh, there's one. Okay. How about any NBA basketball fans? Only a couple? How many of you predicted that the Warriors would sweep Cleveland in four games? Ah, you guys ought to be really involved in the drone business. I hate that word, but that's okay. So, as Mark said, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank Kenobi Martins for providing this excellent venue. Thank uh, Anita Rush and Rupert from MIT Enterprise Forum for facilitating this event and coordinating all the food and getting the guest speakers lined up and whatnot. So thank you all. Let's give them a hand. So as Mark said, I'm Commander David Place, retired, United States Navy. I did 34 years active duty. And about 25 years ago, I had a little crystal ball when I was the commanding officer of uh, the Fleet Composite Squadron 6, which is the Navy's only UAV squadron at the time, my little crystal ball said there's something to this unmanned stuff. I had drones, the real drones, which if you go back about 60 years when drones started, they really were targets. They've kind of morphed into becoming a catch-all phrase for anything unmanned, which is technically not quite right. but. The press can use drone better than, say, an unmanned aircraft system or unmanned aerial vehicle. So here we are with drones. So I did 34 years active duty in the last 25 years, the last 10 years of active duty, and then another 15 years, I was a research associate for the Naval Postgraduate School. And the whole time I was working unmanned systems connectivity issues. So I don't sell anything except my services. I'm just a part-time consultant right now. But a lot of what I do is because I have a passion for this industry and I try and help particularly the small business folks connect with other people that have uh, collaborative opportunities. Uh, I did spend eight years on the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International Board of Directors. So that broadened my horizons from just the DOD aspect into the commercial civil markets. And you will see more about that during my presentation. So now I would like to uh, call up the four panelists. We have Amir Ahmadi from Skylift Global, Dave Twining from Plank Aerosystems, Chris Williams. Did we lose somebody? Where'd you go, Chad? And Chad and uh, Chad Amon from Anova. So what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is provide a two to three minute overview of their company, and then I will give you a little more historical perspective, and then we'll get into the question and, question and answer session from the panel, and then you get your turn. So Amir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Amir Amadi, the CEO of Skylift Global, where um, we are helping uh, firefighters become more productive and uh, work more safely uh, by getting them their supplies uh, with our heavy lift drones. And the problem that we're solving specifically is that firefighters spend most of their time shuttling equipment as opposed to actually extinguishing the fires. And as we've seen recently, this could cost, oh, well, the delay in suppression of fire can cost billions and billions of dollars in economic loss, uh, the risk to firefighter safety. There is a $3 billion workman's comp um, uh, just, just in 2016 because of firefighters' uh, slips and falls. 
And so uh, essentially what we're doing is developing a drone where we have a drone that carries the weight of a firefighter's tools, the distance that that firefighter needs to travel in a fraction of the time. And we do this uh, very unique uh, to us is a lifting capacity. And uh, we're four times more efficient than any other drone. And specifically, that means that we can lift uh, beyond the weight of the vehicle in additional payload. We, are a, we have an 80-pound vehicle right now that can carry over 100 pounds, and there's a video of it outside. It's, it's like a miniature helicopter. Uh, it's um, about uh, 12 feet in diameter, and we aim to have a 100-pound vehicle carry 400 pounds. Uh, and so the impact that this has uh, is pretty widespread. Not only do we, so, so let me explain this situation right here. The, the current method of delivery is very slow and efficient in that the distance that a firefighter needs to travel from a fire engine to the fire line continuously gets longer and longer as they extinguish that fire. They have to go back and forth carrying their equipment, specifically hose packs. What we do is actually just deliver the hose packs to specific drop zones, drop locations. Uh, and we've conducted studies with CAL FIRE with city fire departments in San Diego County, successfully demonstrating that our drone can save them at least half their time in this delivery. Uh, and we did this actually without even getting a drone in the air. What we did was we placed host packs in areas where the drones are actually get dropped off. Uh, but we've taken this data and we provided it to the fire uh, chiefs and the incident commanders. Uh, and it taught them a lot about how they could plan their resources, reallocating air assets to focus on fire suppression, uh, reallocating uh, firefighters so they can focus on the safekeeping of homes and citizens, uh, all just by having the data on where their firefighters need to be. But then the added benefit of actually getting their equipment makes the firefighters, uh, well, it reduces the fatigue, reduces the risk of a fatal mistake, and these slips and falls. This is a picture of us actually working with CAL FIRE and four city fire departments in San Marcos. Uh, that's our team on the, on the bottom right. And I'm happy to answer questions after we, I don't know, is it Q&A right now? No, no okay, it's, it's afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. That's, that's just to give you a flavor of what is out there. Next, we would like Dave Twining from Plank Aerosystems to come up and give an overview of Plank. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming out. I'm Dave Twining. I'm the CEO of uh, Plank Aerosystems. And at Plank, we focus on uh, making drones, we call it simpler, safer, and smarter. Really what we do is we aim to increase the level of autonomy um, for drones so that they can execute missions um, and allow people to focus on the jobs that they're, they're doing rather than piloting the drone. I'm going to use the word drone, uh, much to the commander's dismay. Uh, it, it seems like it has a pretty broad um, acceptance, and I think people generally, at least people here, know what we're talking about and aren't necessarily scared of the term. So drones have actually become quite valuable tools already, even though we're still very early in the, um, their adoption throughout various industries. They're used in defense, border security, fire and rescue. But the, the problem that we address at Plank is, is what we call the stop problems. Basically, to operate drones, users must stop their task to uh, fly and they also must stop moving and in a lot of cases stopping may not be an option so if you are uh, you know a first responder or um, military or, or police you know you may be on the move you have, you're in your truck you have to respond um, of course if you're on a boat boats never actually stop moving even if even if you try they're always pitching and rolling heaving and most of the time if you're on a boat you're space constrained and you have a place to go anyway so what we did at Plank is we, we set out to solve the stop problems. We combined a number of technologies, artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning, optimal control, and then combined that with really exhaustive te testing out in the field from our boat, from our truck, um, with customers, and uh, to, to develop a, a solution that can autonomously operate drones from moving vehicles out in the field. So, Guy's out in his truck, um, he wants to go investigate something that is up a canyon, he can push a button, 
from the cab of the truck. The drone will launch out of the back of the truck, fly up the canyon, automatically detect people. He can, can, he can see those detections. He can see live video, continue to move um, to reposition himself to address those, those issues. Um, and then you know, the drone can automatically come back and land on the truck. He, he is free to continue to do his job while the drone's just helping him collect information. Um, this technology is currently deployed on our own hardware as well as third-party drones for primarily government agencies and commercial maritime operators. Um, so looking forward to tonight, and thank you very much. Chris Williams. So I'm Chris Williams from Citadel Defense Company. Uh, the company is about two years old, and I'm currently now the chief operating officer. So we'll give you an overview. I'm actually the anti-drone guy. So to give you an idea of what our company does, um, we design, develop, and deploy technologies that prevent small drones from accessing protected airspaces, or ground spaces, or sea spaces. So think of us as you know a, a precision kind of mitigation technique that when you see these unwanted drones entering a specific airspace, we shoot them down with you know, targeted RF power. So nothing like a laser, nothing like a missile. Basically, you know, it's, it's blind to the human eye. Um, and what, what we've developed that's unique, a lot of people get a connotation around jamming. So what we like to say, because we all know that jamming isn't allowed, is we developed a countermeasure approach that actually leverages um, you know, an escalation path where some of our targeted precision mitigation techniques don't disrupt Wi-Fi, BLE, or signals that operate on the frequency band of most drones, and that's what's made us unique. Um, to keep it really short, basically we've relied on operators to inform, well, operators and economics to inform the direction we've gone. So when you think about what's happened in the commercial space, you know, there's a lot of regulation that's kind of prevented innovation. So we've pivoted our business from previously protecting critical infrastructure in the US or stadiums to uh, now focusing primarily on the military because that market's moving uh, quickly. So we've got units that are now deployed uh, overseas as well as domestically uh, with DOD customers. And technology has been validated by third party government testing agencies, authorities uh, with combat evals to support it. And now we're just getting ready to uh, to, to scale our business and, and grow it this year. So that's Citadel Defense. Thanks, Chris. And now Chad Amon from Inova. Hi, everybody. I'm Chad Amon, CEO and co-founder of Inova Drone. Four years ago, I was working as a lead drone designer for 3D Robotics, another San Diego-based drone company. And I had the opportunity to really meet a lot of the customers using the technology, the platforms we were creating, and other platforms out in the market. I saw how people like first responders, people that were using these drones to try and save lives, uh, put these things in dangerous situations like wildfires, they were really battling the technology more than they were actually using it to be more efficient with their application. And so I was uh, inspired to create a Nova drone with my co-founders. And so four, year ago, four years ago, we launched a Nova drone. And the idea is really to, to make something much, much easier to use and more reliable so that these drones really will perform when they're needed most, when lives are on the line. So right now, our primary customer base is the, the DOD. So we have the Army, Marines, Navy, and the Air Force currently uh, as customers that we're approaching. Uh, we have public safety as a primary application. We believe a lot that these, these platforms are absolutely critical for people like first responders to, to get these things in the air, to find those people when they're needed most. And uh, we also have a, um, a separate part of the company that's actually going after commercial applications, uh, very specific commercial applications like infrastructure inspection, uh, long, long range power line type of uh, applications. But with the DOD, you know, the military as well as public safety operators, when, when they get to a new environment, they're often faced with the same challenge. They get to this new scenario, this new uh, location, and there's often a lot of danger in these environments. And, and they typically get there really quickly, and they don't know 
where these hazards are, where the safe way in and out of these environments are. And so it's really important that within the first few minutes on a scene like this, they get a platform in the air, they get that aerial perspective, and they can make those mission critical decisions in, in a timely manner so that lives uh, really aren't going to be put in jeopardy. So what we call that is actually situational awareness, and that's a, a common uh, theme throughout our customer base. It's, it's about having the perspective around you, knowing where the challenges are, how you're going to face them very quickly. So we actually have three different uh, platforms, drone platforms. Uh, this is actually the largest and most recent one that we just uh, unveiled a few months ago. Uh, we've delivered a few of these to the United States Air Force. We, if you've seen our smaller platform out uh, on the booth out there, that was actually one of our first models. It's uh, about a 45 minute flight time designed for use in harsh weather with long distance communication. Well, what we did for the Air Force was actually enhance the propulsion system, make custom batteries, and even enhance the radio communication capabilities so that we can fly an hour and a half in harsh weather and we can get up to 12 kilometers of range. And this is really uh, pushing the envelope as far as the technology industry. Um, we have about a 7.5 kilogram payload capability, so that's uh, able to lift quite a bit. And we have a, a modular sensor interface so that a variety of different types of sensors can be very quickly uh, connected to the aircraft. Uh, in the bottom middle part of the screen, you can see two of the camera payloads we've developed. Uh, both of them have a HD uh, zoom camera with uh, thermal imagers so you can see at night and see through smoke and you know, through tree canopies. Uh, another thing on the far bottom right is our controller. We've developed that entirely in-house. Uh, this is powered by a powerful Android uh, tablet computer in the center. And with our radio communication, uh, like I said, we can get up to 12 kilometers of, of link range to the aircraft. So what the operator uses this for is to plan the mission, to get the live HD video on the screen, the live telemetry aircraft um, health status, uh, as well as you know, be able to control every aspect of the aircraft while in operation. And uh, that's it. That's Anova. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. So two things occurred to me during the panelists' brief introductions. One, you, that's just a sampling of the many missions that are out there for, as Dave likes to say, drones. But the problem I have with drones is you get, there's a quadcopter that landed on a lady in a fair, and the newspaper, the press, reports, drone hits lady, and they show a picture of a reaper. Well, a reaper is a very large uh, Air Force UAV, and so the, the, the press has a tendency not quite to get the story correct, and that just puts a bad name, because when one of these drones or UAVs hits, another, hits an airliner or something, that's going to be catastrophic for the entire industry. <clears throat> so that's my hang up with, uh, with the term drone. Plus, I did drones. We really did launch targets that ships shot at with their missiles uh, 25 years ago. <clears throat> anyway, um, so these are only four panelists. We probably could have 40 more panelists just from here in San Diego. If you went to Denver to the AUVSI, Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, trade show last month up in Denver, there were over 725 exhibitors and about 8,000 attendees. So that's a great venue to uh, get your stuff put on display. And this year there were a lot more international folks, Koreans, Polish, Dutch, German, Chinese, Japanese, Singapore, Canadian, a lot of different companies. So there's a huge market out there. And if you're at all interested, what I'm going to try and do is provide you with some background, uh, show you what the various groups are, because the groups do matter, and some acronyms, and then a couple of resources that you might find useful, if I can get this to work. Oh. Anita was smarter than I am. She made it build in. One other thing I want to address before I get started is, I don't know how many of you check out the San Diego Tribune, but for the past month or so, there's been numerous articles talking about, quote, drones. San Diego was one of 149 applicants. There were 10 applicants that were chosen to support the Department of Transportation's 
um, let me get the term right here, integration pilot program, UAS integration pilot program. That program is designed here in San Diego because we have access to the water, to the border, to the mountains. We have rural areas, we have urban areas, and this team of folks, of which the City of San Diego, Chula Vista, San Diego Economic Development Corporation, uh, Department of Homeland Security, they are all involved, and what they're going to try and do is help the FAA identify what the rules should be for operating beyond line of sight, um, operating over the border, et cetera, et cetera. Because right now, the FAA, there's a, you're fairly restricted on how you can use your drone. 400 feet and below, line of sight only, um, and a max of 55 pounds. So anything bigger or higher or you can't use it unless you get a certificate of authorization or waiver from the FAA. I was hoping that either Tiffany Benson or Jesse Geit from San Diego Economic Development Corporation could be here to answer some of your questions. I have a few groups on that. What they, they're going to look at food and package delivery, medical supply, transport, and border security. They're going to try and help the FAA develop the ground rules. Like I said, they were one of 10, and there were 149 applicants. Um, so that's probably about enough on that. I can answer some general questions, but I also have points of contact if you'd like to get in touch with them. So, so they're all on the same playing field. This is just a list of acronyms. You guys can read probably better than I. So these are just some terms that you may hear discussed throughout the panel's discussion. Like certificate of authorization, that's a COA. That's a big issue. A lot of folks would like to be able to do a lot more stuff with their drones, but they're fairly restricted by the FAA right now. Uh, I'm not slamming the FAA. Their job is to protect the national airspace. But they are, their tolerance for risk is zero. Like I said, if one of these UAVs hits a small private aircraft or a commercial airliner or hits a person, it's going to be catastrophic for the industry. So I mentioned groups. So this is group one. This is 25 pounds. What you have here is a Raven and a Puma built by Aero Environment, a Wasp also. And then there's a generic quadcopter in the lower right, much like you'll see around the corner here. So these smaller things are the ones that are out there flying. The hobbyists fly them. Um, I got an email from USAA today said, drones and economic zones. I'm going, USAA drones, really? I'm, so the insurance companies are using them to survey, see what kind of damage was done. So that's group one. Group twos. So the FAA rules basically you can fly a group one or a group two with a 107 certificate, which means you've been certified. You still can't fly within five miles of an airport. You still can't go above 400 feet. And some of those examples are the Scan Eagle, built by in situ. Silver Fox was initially built by Advanced Ceramics Corporation, and Aerosan that's built by Bell Textronics. So a quick little story here on the Scan Eagle. That bird has been around for about 14 years. It was originally designed to go out and be a fish spotter in the Pacific Northwest. They'd launch it off a fishing boat, they'd go out and look for schools of fish, and then the boat would know where to go to cast their nets. Well, if you've ever seen one of these things land, it's kind of a, it's an exciting event, let's put it that way. So it launches with a pneumatic launcher, and when it comes back, it's got a differential GPS in the nose of the aircraft. It's got a differential GPS on the boom that it recovers. And from that boom is a 5 8 inch rope. And on each wing tip of this 10 foot wingspan is a clamp on each wing. So any place that that bird hits on the rope, it grabs the clamp and it kind of flops around like a wounded duck and they pull it in. But the military has been using that since 05. It's, and, but they're doing COCO, so it's contractor-owned, contractor-operated. Uh, some special operations folks have those that they've bought, but for the most part, they're contracted services. 
Group three, we're starting to get up into the bigger birds. This is where the FAA goes, well, that's a big aircraft. As you can see, it can go up to 1,300 pounds. If that hits an airliner, it's not going to be a minor incident. But the Army and the Marine Corps are flying the shadow there on the left. And then the Blackjack is the big brother to the Scan Eagle you saw on the previous slide. And the Marines and the Navy have that asset. I'm providing you this military connection so you understand where this all started. Hunter is a Army system, never was a program of record, but they're still out there flying. The next picture is a Fire Scout. That's the MQ-8 Charlie, which is built based on a Bell 407 helicopter. And the one on the right is a Predator, built by General Atomics here in San Diego. Now we're up to the big boys, big, big boys. Reapers and MQ-9, another General Atomics product. This is a lot more potent than the Predator. The next picture in the middle there is a Global Hawk. Air Force flies those. The Navy flies a variant. Those birds go up to like 60,000 feet. So with those things flying around, there's not really much danger of running any commercial activity. And the last one on the right is, there's a long story behind that, but I'll keep it short. CBARS is uh, it's a carrier-based area refueling system. The Secretary of the Navy and the CNO couldn't agree. One wanted a strike asset, and the other wanted an um, ISR asset, long endurance. So they went back and forth for about four years, and they finally said, OK, well, we'll make it a tanker. And you go, what? Tanker? <clears throat> that doesn't do either of those other missions. <clears throat> so that's what it's, um, that's kind of a, that's the, uh, that's what we envision it to look like, something like that. Uh, the, the, the actual product has not been selected yet. Lockheed Martin, General Atomics, and Boeing have three candidates in. Um, Northrop Grumman, who actually built the test bed, has pulled out of the competition. So there's a little more on C bars. It started off as U class, then it went to UCAS, et cetera, et cetera. You can see it was a program of record for the past six years, and they haven't even, they just finished getting the request for proposal on the street. So like I said, the air vehicle's not, it's not gonna IOC in FY20, trust me. BAMS D, that was an Air Force Global Hawk that the Navy, um, we bought two of those. We sent it over to the Central Command Area of Responsibility for a six-month deployment, but that was eight years ago. It's still there. So clearly, the, the general over there really likes that asset. But that's the one that flies up at, you see it's 131 feet, so it's pretty big. And the Navy's program of record for the Global Hawk is going to be, is called Triton. BAMS was brought out in maritime surveillance, and that really does. It goes up 60,000 or so feet, and it just provides long endurance surveillance, like over 27 hours. So all these unmanned systems, I know the Air Force won't call them that. They don't call them unmanned aerial vehicles. They call them remote piloted aircraft. The Air Force is the only one that calls them that, by the way, because um, their perspective is, they're not unmanned. You have people on the ground. You have people controlling them. You have maintenance technicians on the ground. You have analysts that are looking at the imagery. So it's not really unmanned. Well, technically, that's true, except there's no pilot in the aircraft. Scan Eagle, I already told you about that, how it started off as a looking for gallon and a half of gas, 27 hours. That's pretty efficient but only can carry 10 pounds of payload. And they are out there flying every day. There's a lot of foreign countries that are also using Scan Eagle, so they're not all military applications. The Marine Corps, they fly Shadows, Scan Eagles, and the Blackjack. And then they have a little Raven that's just hand launched. If you want to look over the hill, why put up a 1,300 pound bird to go look? Just throw it up, let it look over the hill, and bring it back. So the takeaways from the 
military summary. After doing that for 25 years, I could tell you a lot more, but I won't. Uh, so there's three current programs of record that are assets are actually out there. The BAMS, or the Triton, Firescat, and the Small Tactical UAS, or the Blackjack. And then CBARS is the one that's still up in the air. Medium range MRMUAS was medium range maritime system, which is personally what I thought the Navy should have, launched from a, any deck, could go like 900 miles, stay out there for two hours and come back. The Navy canceled that back in 2012. The uh, program office or the requirements guy said, well, we don't have any money and there's nothing that can solve that problem very quickly. Fire Scout has limited endurance, four or five hours. I don't think they fully tested the Belfort 7 variant. It may get a little bit longer. It's got a little more payload, but it's light right now. It's light of sight. If I want to go over the horizon, I need something more than line of sight. In the turn, that was initially stood for Tactical Exploitable Reconnaissance Node. It was a DARPA initiative. Right now, Northrop Grumman is building a prototype, and we'll see how well that works. So other than signing up for my newsletter, and I have some cards with my email address, I publish, I do this, nobody pays me to do this. I uh, put out a newsletter every week to 10 days. And what I do is I just compile from a bunch of sources, national defense. Um, I have a couple of sources that send me articles, the Union Tribune, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. I try and take a bunch of articles and put them together. It's fairly short, like eight lines. I give you the title of the article, the a couple of sentences to pique your interest, and then a hyperlink. If that topic interests you, go look at it. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. But I do that just to save people time because every day there's more stuff in the press. So if you'd like to get on my distribution list, I'm not selling subscriptions. But I've got like 500 folks, and they're almost all unmanned systems. Most of them are air related, but there's some others. So another source that you might want to take note of is Cruiser, the Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems Education Research. I worked for that group at the Postgraduate School, although I did it here in San Diego, for 14 years. There's a lot of academic work that is advertised in this product. They don't spam you. They have a meeting that you can dial into once a week or once a month, and they send out an announcement for that. But if you go to the website, you can see the articles that are being written and see some of the other stuff that's going on. They used to publish my newsletter when I was a research associate, but they haven't done one for the past 18 months. Geez, I wonder why. So they're supposed to have a monthly newsletter. I haven't seen a lot of those since I left. But they also have a classified website as well if you have a clearance. Another group that, so Cruiser is, is a Secretary of the Navy program. He said we need, a, we need a community of interest for collaboration, lessons learned, that kind of thing. So it's not all military by any stretch of the imagination. So you'd see a lot of commercial civil applications. So go to the Cruiser website. And the director of Cruiser is Dr. Bittner. He's also the director for the Joint Interagency Field Experimentation. I know Amir has been up there. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has been up there, but it's a venue that's conducted quarterly, typically up at Camp Roberts, up uh, north of Paso Robles. And it's, it says experimentation, but it's, in reality, it's a demonstration. But you go up there, and there's, I think the last, they just had one earlier this month, and they had like 150 people or more. And there were, well, I'll show you in a second. So the GIFX and NPS is a website to go to. GIFX provides quarterly events, intersection points. Technically, the primary customer is the science and technology advisors from the combatant commanders, CENTCOM, NORTHCOM, PACOM, uh, AFRICOM, UCOM, SOUTHCOM. But their S&T guys go to see what industry is bringing. And they may go back to their four-star boss and say, 
you know, we need this capability and it's already there. These guys demonstrated it. So it's a good chance to get some good visibility. It's not a sales event, a demo, expo or trade show. Uh, they encourage people to collaborate with each other. And if you have an issue, no big deal. Let's fix it while you're there. It's, it goes on for about a week up in Northern California. Northern California. So you'd say, well, joint interagency, that's DOD. Well, not so fast. Look at the big blue section there. That's private industry, 47%. Anybody can go up there and see what's going on. You just have to submit your request to attend. And you can go to the website and see when the next event was. So the last one was June, so probably the next one will be September. But it's a good opportunity to go out and see what a bunch of different vehicles are doing. And if you want to participate, you can submit an experiment proposal to that website. So you've heard a lot about military use or some of the systems that are used by the military. So here, <clears throat> this is just, this is by all not an, an inclusive, not all inclusive list, but here's some things some various domains where drones or UAVs can be used and are being used today. There's an article in the paper about two weeks ago. In Saudi Arabia, they're using drones, not aerial drones, but ground drones, to do their fashion shows. So they've pulled the, peep, the ladies out from doing the fashion shows. They're using robots. So what's next? I don't know. The guy back here that predicted the Warriors were going to win in four, maybe he can tell us. But I mean, this the industry is so far ahead of, quote, the requirements. Industry is building stuff, and you're going, I mean, take Austin Blue from Peregrine back over there. Austin has been in this business for a long time, and he's developing some really cool stuff. But the problem is finding a, a consumer that has the same insight that he does, and that's not trivial. So the more folks, that we can educate on what's out there, what's available. So my, one of my soapboxes is, so there's lots of birds. There's a ton of quadcopters built by, a lot of them by DJI, the Chinese company. Those are just trucks, really. Some trucks have more capability than others, but the truck doesn't do anything for you unless you want to use it for logistics, pretty much. But almost anything else, there's a specific mission. What do you want to do with that truck? I want to go fight fires. I want to deliver defibrillator kits. I want to help fight forest fires. So it's the mission that's critical. And the payload, whether it be a weapon system, a comm system, uh, intelligence uh, video, daytime video, nighttime, LiDAR, there's lots of sensors out there, biometric sensors. <clears throat> they fly them over, you can fly them, the farmers are using them to fly over their fields and see how much moisture is in the field. Do they need to water more? Are there pests there? So there's just a ton of applications, but it's the payload on that truck that really helps you solve the problem. That's my contact info. If you want to write it down, you can, or you can ask me for a business card. And I'll get it to you if you want to get on my distribution list, which is not critical. Anybody get general questions for me before we go into the panel discussion? Wow. I thought I was very, very good or very, very bad. One of the two. <clears throat> was I too long, Anita? Okay, so we have heard about one of the challenges is the FAA. That's my perspective. That's a good question. How big of an impact have these assets had <clears throat> from my perspective? So in 1993, we were flying the, they called it RPV, remotely piloted vehicle, called the Pioneer. It was an Israeli product that we bought off the shelf. In fact, our maintenance manuals came in Hebrew. My guys had a tough time reading that. But anyway, um, 
So they were doing primarily surveillance during the first Gulf War. And they would fly over and they would identify suspected targets. And in fact, there's a CNN clip where the Iraqis came out and waved their white flag to the drone. Not because they thought the drone was going to attack them, but because they knew shortly thereafter there'd be 16-inch shells coming from the battleship. So they're going, no, don't shoot, don't shoot. So we started off in very rudimentary ISR capabilities. As I mentioned, the industry is just fabulous. You guys out there that are in the industry are developing stuff a lot quicker than we can keep up with. The problem is correlating that capability, the technology that folks are developing, and getting it in to where it's being used, quote, requirements. But they use drones for Osama bin Laden to identify him. Um, a lot of the focus has been on, on unmanned aerial vehicles, but we're also starting to use them for unmanned surface vehicles. So you, ships that can go out, they can check the salinity of the water, they can check tides, currents. Um, there's underwater vehicles that we can also use to do that same. There's gliders that'll go for months, and they just glide with the currents. So I don't think we have begun to scratch the surface of how they can be used. What have they done so far? They've done quite a bit. They provide lots of targeting. Um, so if you go way back, the idea behind having UAVs was to go out and do the dull, dirty, dangerous missions, OK? If it's dull, why send a helicopter out there to just drone around looking for something? Send a UAV. It can do it. You don't have a man in the cockpit. Uh, or if it's dangerous, why put somebody's life at risk? Dull, dirty. Dirty is like in um, a nuclear reactor blows. Instead of sending a man crew in there to do the detections, you send a remote vehicle in there that can do all the chemical detections, determine radiological. So there's a ton of sensors out there. So we have, they have contributed quite a bit. I think there's a lot more we can do. But if we can open up the airspace, that'll open up some of these markets like precision agriculture, public safety. So from the military perspective, I mean, they wouldn't keep buying if they weren't doing good stuff. Some of the stuff they do can't, is not, you can't talk about. OK. The boss says take questions later. So my question for the panel, first question, and we'll hopefully go through these. We're only going to have two questions. We'll do these pretty quick so we can have more time for your Q&A. So panelists, we have a nice broad perspective here from what you guys have learned and what you do and how you do it. So what, we'll just start with Amir and run right down the line. What do you see as the current challenges for using unmanned aerial vehicles in today's environment? So when you say today's environment, I'm specifically focused in with firefighters, first responders, and public safety. Uh, and uh, uh, agree with your point that it's mission focus, we call use case focus. The two problems that I see is inter interoperability with uh, technology and uh, with other assets that they're already using. Uh, and the second is data collection, analysis, and modeling. Uh, so what we've learned actually putting, uh, getting in the field with uh, firefighters learning about new use cases by way of introducing our value proposition, we learned that there's really no data being collected for the types of logistics uh, that they do. And that's a huge value add that we only found out inadvertently. Right? We were thinking, come in, here's a UAV. It's going to solve a problem, we think. Uh, but the real problem was actually their ability to plan resources effectively. Uh, and they can do that with data. And I think uh, that leads into some future challenges I'd like to kind of uh, Amir brings up a good point. So we have like, I don't know, 25 or 27 orbits, Reapers that are up there flying every day, 24 hours a day. The Navy has their Triton or their BAMS D up there. The hours of data that are accumulated, we don't have nearly enough analysts to analyze that stuff. So one of the things when I've spoken before, like at the Technology Training Corporation event, industry says, well, so what do, you, what do we need that we don't have? Well, one of the areas that I think we can still use a lot of assistance is, is automatic target recognition. If you have the tools, the software, that can identify a set target, 
whether it be a fire or a threat, if we can have the, the software to identify those issues, then the analyst can focus on the key areas and not have to, I mean, the hours of video, if you will, that end up on the cutting room floor is just ridiculous. Dave? Yeah, I agree with everything Amir said. I think there are also kind of the obvious challenges which have to do with airspace regulation and wireless spectrum um, regulation. And the fact that uh, industry really is outpacing a lot of the regulatory environment so that a lot of this technology is, is really deployable. It's ready to go. Um, th there's even customers on the other side ready to use it, um, both in, I mean, obviously the consumer space, but the commercial space and the government space as well. But they are often stymied by the regulatory environment. I'm not suggesting the FAA should just, and the FCC should just be like, oh yeah, go do whatever you want. But they're, we're, we're moving towards, um, a, not a reckoning, but we're moving towards a, a position where um, things are going to have to be adapted and, and changed. And um, these regulatory agencies are going to have to kind of understand what, what needs to happen. And they're, they're working very hard to learn that now. I think the FAA gets all the news, but the FCC is is probably right behind there. Um, if you have a, a lot of aircraft in the air and they're collecting a lot of data and transmitting it to remote locations, um, and those things are all over the place because they're doing functional jobs, that's a that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of spectrum. Um, and, and understanding how to effectively manage that is is a big challenge. And from a business standpoint, you know that's something that we're we're kind of waiting for um, guidance on from the regulatory agencies so we can know how to deploy our technology more efficiently. Dave brings up a good point. June 12th, Union Tribune, front page, report, FAA stifling commercial drone use. So Dave is right on the money there, and I think anybody that's working in the industry would concur with that. I don't work for the FAA, but they're just, they are just absolutely petrified that there's going to be a mishap. And then everybody will go, yeah. the FAA said you could fly. So they're going to point the finger at the FAA. So that's what they're trying to protect against. So Chris, what do you think? Yeah, so a lot of what <clears throat> everyone else said I'd share, but uh, three things in general. I'd say regulation, which everyone has shared as sentiment. I also view that as an opportunity. Economics for small startups. Um, you're actually seeing challenges now where, like David alluded to, you know, the Innovation, is, innovation and technology is outpacing regulation. The challenge here is much of the innovation is actually coming from startups. When you look at the defense industry, even in commercial in some, some areas, you're seeing product development life cycles of like you know three to five years, which you know the rate of innovation. You look at Moore's law. You know the electronic innovation is now outpacing the rate at which you know DoD industry and even in some cases commercial is operating at because they've got a lot of legacy tech. And then the third piece, I mean, I think this is fortunate for Citadel, is with the drone proliferation, how is that now being you know, protected, mitigated, or defended against? And you know, a few numbers to just kind of quickly throw out is you know, there was about, I think, 327 or 320,000 uh, commercial airlines in 2017. And now you've got 4.5 million drones purchased. So there's proliferation of drones, which inevitably are going to end up in the wrong hands of consumers. And uh, one of the risks we see and why we started our company is how do we actually prevent or protect um, you know, all, of, all of us as well as you know, companies and the military uh, to defend against it. So Chris brings up a good point on uh, the economic side of things. Article from last month's paper said that just for inspecting power lines, railways, oil and gas pipelines, the projected cost for that is $27 billion annually. And back to Amir's point, another $20 billion in analytics. $47 billion per year just to inspect those infrastructure assets. Chad, what do you think? Speaking on regulations, one interesting thing that a lot of people don't necessarily think about <clears throat> is what are the regulations on the data that are collected by these end users? You know, these government officials, it could be a, a firefighter flying a drone for a 
routine mission. It could be a, a law enforcement officer. They're flying these high definition cameras around the sky. Typically they're over people's backyards in sensitive locations. There's no real regulations well defined on what to do with that aerial imagery. And it's a big concern for privacy. And I think that that's a, a big thing that needs to be figured out both um, from the government side of things as well as from the, um, the manufacturers. The manufacturers making changes in the software on their aircraft so that the, the data can be better controlled and you can turn on and off the camera when they're in uh, certain spots uh, where it's, it makes sense. Another thing um, on the hardware side is, is obstacle avoidance. So a lot of these companies and the future of, of this industry is, is going beyond line of sight. And when you do that, the aircraft is far out of sight. And you really have to have a lot of trust in the system that it's not going to be running into things. There's only so much you can see with a, a small little camera pointing forward on the aircraft and in the live video feed. Uh, it's, it's very hard to see things like power lines and fishing lines and branches and, and things change very dynamically. And so beyond line of sight operations are going to be very limited by the reliability of the obstacle avoidance sensors. And we don't have that figured out yet. DJI and a lot of these other Chinese drone manufacturers, they create these products and they say it has obstacle avoidance in it. But really it's basic, very, very rudimentary basic obstacle avoidance that only works in certain ideal conditions. And there's a lot of scenarios where those types of sensors really do not perform uh, the way that they're going to need to. Thanks, Chad. So in the interest of brevity here, I would much prefer, uh, I know there are some questions from the audience, I'd like to move this along a little bit and well, I'm going to ask the panelists for one, one final assessment and so we can get to some of your Q&A, we don't want to drag this on too long. But So gents, is there, I mean I think you very clearly, all of you have articulated the problems that we are encountering today. So other than fixing those problems that currently exist, do you see anything significant, let's say, five to ten years down the road that you anticipate might be a problem that we really haven't addressed? If you don't have anything, that's fine, and we can get to the audience. But if you do, I think they'd like to hear your concerns. Go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> uh, two things in regards to, to future potential problems, and this kind of uh, draws on a bigger vision of where the industry or any other industries that develop out of this technology. One is the predicting the evolution of the technology. Uh, we alluded to it earlier in terms of uh, you know the UAVs coming out of the military and now the market really accelerating that. Uh, but to make it accessible, to make it available, and make it affordable enough where we're actually using it in, let's say, interconnected cities. And I think that would be a second um, challenge. I wouldn't call it a problem because I think uh, it's a pretty exciting challenge to, to tap into. But interconnected cities, going back to the data, what do we actually do with the data? What do the cities do with the data? They don't even know, right? And we're talking about municipalities that are slow to adopt the technology, let alone the data that they get from that technology. Um, but if it's left up to commercial entities, they still obviously want to regulate them, going, kind of go back to, to the FAA. Uh, I'll be, next week I'll be speaking at San Diego Startup Week about transportation as a service, which is a potential industry that's going to evolve out of all of this UAV and driverless cars and whatnot. Uh, and there's some questions that people have posed in terms of concerns about, let's say, Tesla reporting your speed to the police and the police mailing a ticket to you. You know, just really app what's the next level that you have to take from, from there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, getting the approvals kind of like you would with a certificate of authorization in order to actually um, apply your technology in interconnected cities, apply your technology to integrate with other ones, whether at GIFIX or uh, the IPP down in, in San Diego, in Chula, I'm sorry, in Chula Vista, uh, or just interconnected through, through collaborations, which is really the essence of San Diego. I mean, the, the three guys we have on you know, up, up here with me that I have the privilege of, of working with. Uh, you know, we have Plank that, that can help us with precision. We have uh, Citadel that can help us with assurance. And we have uh, an Overdrone that can help us with awareness. So there's a lot of ways that we can work together. Um, but how do we predict the evolution and how do we prevent or uh, really pave the route towards a, a bright future with this technology? Manage, managing the data is, is an obvious one. I mean, the, the amount of data generated is, is kind of shocking sometimes. 
Also, the level of autonomy of these systems is increasing rapidly, and that that's great if, if it can be controlled and used for good, right? But um, the making sure that technology stand, stays in, um, I guess, the, the friendly hands of, of people is is going to be a, a massive challenge, um, and and Citadel is, you know, taking the first step to to address that challenge, but it, it it's it's big, right? I mean, not just kind of at our level, the the tactical level where we operate, but also at the strategic level, you know, making sure you, control of these systems maintains it stays in the hands of the people you want it to you want. The, Stays in the hands of the people you want it to want to have it is. It's a big challenge, um, and I, I see that not going away anytime soon. Yeah, Chris is going to fix all that, right? That's the, that's the hope. Um, but to me, the the thing that you know I think we're most worried about as a company, and me specifically, is how do we prevent catastrophe or a catastrophic event from happening? Because then that's going to actually halt. All the innovation that's happening in the space, it'll you know pause regulation, and it's actually going to prevent a lot of the good uses that UAVs could be put towards, like everyone on the panel has already mentioned. Um, so trying to get ahead of the problem kind of now, but I think it's something that you know is probably still going to be a concern or worry, you know, a few years from now. And to me, kind of taking what's happened in you know a military use case where you look at what happened with IEDs, and then what happened with snipers. And now Secretary of Defense you know, had those as the top priority, and now you know, counter drone or UAVs is now a top priority. And it's something where these industries have evolved over time to have a very, call it, you know, disadvantageous impact to not just troops, but now it's moved into civilians where people are putting IEDs on themselves and you know, blowing up places in commercial uh, locations. So, it's how do we prevent that evolution from negative, you know, use that's we've now seen um, technology has demonstrated before. Chad, do you got anything? Yeah, so I think we can all agree that drones are here to stay. There's only going to be more of them in the future. They're going to be getting bigger. They're going to be flying closer to people. They're going to be used for more and more important missions. I think one thing that needs to be thought about is cybersecurity. Like, these things are flying computers. There's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to have new ways of causing havoc with, you know, taking these things out in you know, specific locations. And so it's sort of uh, similar to what you guys are doing. You're, you're working on taking out the, the bad drones, but, you know, bad guys can take out good drones and cause damage as well. So that's something that not a lot of people have talked about yet. Ch Chad brings up a good point. In fact, Secretary of Defense just recently put out a memo last month, I guess, that prohibited all DOD from purchasing COTS, commercial off the shelf. And the big concern is that these flying computers that Chad's talking about, he's concerned about cybersecurity. And are the Chinese, in fact, using their drones that are all over the place to record conversations, buy on you, whatever. So, I mean, there's a lot of concerns, and these panelists all brought up brought up a real good point. One other source I didn't mention, I mentioned AUVSI, but AUVSI.org is an international trade group. Monica England is right here. She's the vice president of the San Diego chapter. So if you would like to get together with Monica, she's very well connected. And she also facilitates a lot of the local chapter events. Last note, um, about six years ago, AUVSI conducted a study to say, okay, there's more than DOD. So where's the next market? Anybody want to guess what the number one is? You can't answer, Darcy, because you know. Anybody want to guess? What's the number one market outside of DOD for unmanned systems? What? Yes, ma'am. Precision agriculture. Real estate is being used, but those are small potatoes. Precision agriculture, public safety, and number three is autonomous cars. So take that for what it's worth. OK, so we've got just a couple of minutes. We, there were some questions before. Go ahead. How do and we stop? The question is, how, do, how, do, how does Amir stop his drones from melting in the fire? <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, the concern is if our drones uh, go near the flames during wildfire 
uh, scenario situations or the currents. Uh, so first and foremost, they won't be uh, in those areas. The drop zones that uh, are already established during an initial attack, uh, which is there's three phases during when, when, when there's a wildfire that the incident command takes. The initial attack is when the fire is the most dynamic and they need to figure out a plan of containing this. Uh, in that plan, they establish certain drop zones that are in very safe areas that are away from the fire because it's areas where they need to have, um, well, not only the personnel, not only the firefighters, but also their equipment. Uh, and they establish these areas knowing full well that there could be 40 mile an hour winds blowing this, uh, you know, this fire and turning it into a 10,000 acre fire overnight, right? So first and foremost, that, but addressing the wind question, uh, we've flown our vehicles in about 20 to 30 mile an hour winds, constant winds, uh, in Montana where we build our, our vehicles. Uh, and there are at times there were 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts. So we know, and it's very stable, you actually see the video outside uh, where the vehicle is, the way it's flying in that moderate condition, it flies just as smoothly and as stably as um, in, in the conditions in the high winds in Montana. Um, but we're still developing, uh, and so it, it is a good point, and this is where it comes back to interoperability with your environment, with the other technologies, other air assets, ground assets, and ensuring that your vehicle is going to succeed in that mission, or what we call the use case. Uh, last week, the AUBSI local chapter had the no, holding that up, um, fire chief from L.A., down to give a presentation. And they've got eight drones that they're using. Now, all those drones are in an urban environment, but they're using those primarily for surveillance. So they're not actually flying them into the fire, but they're using them to identify hot spots and tell the firefighters where to go. Next. So what's the top need of the industry, says Dr. Byron. I can take a step. So I, I would say it's the ability for uh, kind of commercial groups, federal, state, local governments to come at solutions for uh, reg around regulation. I think it's something that's impacting the, the entire industry. It's also impacting government. It's something that you know typically doesn't move quickly. Um, and if it doesn't move quickly, uh, a lot of the good benefits that UAVs bring uh, won't be recognized. I think that's just something that traditionally it's a very waterfall approach to getting policy through and something now where if you look at that like two to three year time span where it sometimes takes to push laws through, that won't suffice here. So. I, I think Chris brings up a good point, which is part of the reason why Department of Transportation issued this integrated priority plan uh, process for the com local communities, the tribes, um, industry to all get together and help help identify the exact, your, answer your question, what are the critical issues and how can we solve them as a group rather than putting the onus on the FAA to solve everything? Because a lot of it has to do with airspace integration. But that's part of the reason behind this conglomeration. The ed educational institutions, many of the schools are getting, having their own drone programs. They have a little bit different perspective that they can bring in. Industry brings another perspective. And then you got the vehicle operators, the payload operators, yada, yada, yada. So, but I think Chris Spring hits the nail on the head pretty much. It's, it's really a challenge. And the more people we have, of course, you don't want too many people. I mean, if you get 20 people in a room, you get 25 different answers. But still, if we get the right folks together, I think we can come up with some pretty good solutions. Anybody else see anything bigger than what Chris came up with? We all work with public agencies, and procurement is um, not really well designed for adopting innovation quickly, and, and even at the trial level, right? Even getting systems to try and see if it's something that can help you achieve your mission. Um, there are efforts to change that, um, and sometimes those efforts start real quickly and then die, die just as quickly because the established base uh, prime contractors are, are working hard to defend their position within their government. I get it, it's, it's a good business move. But it, the procurement um, cycle is, is really stifling to, for adoption overall. Well, so yeah, that's a good point, Dave. So where do you, if, you're not, if you're not supporting a DOD contract, where does private industry go to get funding? What are some potential sources? If somebody out in the audience wants to start a company, where might they go to look for 
money. There's not a shortage of money in the startup community for UAS. I mean, there's three billion in funding that's been released in the past like 18 months. From whom? VCs, private angels, investors. private. Um, the challenge is, is kind of getting getting your head uh, in the door is the big biggest challenge. What we're seeing. I mean, we we were fortunate enough to benefit from going and raising around last year. Uh, but you see, like a lot of the money that's actually going in is going to, you know, not not the big primes because they're not in defense, but DJI who goes and gets you know 550 million. Um, it goes to the predominant players who are already have traction in the space, and sometimes that makes it difficult for the smaller players to get entrants who are more willing to try and innovate and push boundaries. So, I think there's two other areas on top of that. If I can be brief, uh, one is uh, grants. I think there's a lot of academic institutions that would like to be able to develop technology and work with you for SDTRs, SBIRs, as a government grants. And there's other types of government grants that you could tap into. Uh, third is uh, the way we were able to get in investors, angel investors, was showing that there was a market need for this. And so looking at it for market application, yeah, you might have a, you could look at it as a segment, you could look at it as a market, you know, total addressable market, all that stuff. But when you segment down, you base it off of somebody's need, your customer's need on this. And they don't always know what that is until you actually introduce your technology and maybe even think of different scenarios. It could be completely crazy scenarios. But just by coming up with those ideas, then the customers will think, oh, you know what? I could do this, I could do that. And then you realize that there's a need that they have. You provide the solution based on that need, and then you can break through and maybe figure out ways, creative ways of, of tapping into the funds. And that's a way that we've been learning uh, to, to kind of bypass the, the, or you know, kind of overcome that problem with the public safety procurement process is um, to, to put together a package or a service that is already a finished package or service. Uh, and then they'll figure out a creative way of tapping into different budgets and using a budget from, from a fund that you wouldn't even think would be for your purpose. You think it's for drones, but it, they'd pull from somewhere, I don't know, the water authority or something. Um, I'll be sure, yeah, that, that's good enough. <laughs> so the offshore oil companies, you know, they have all these platforms, these drilling rigs out there. Could you use unmanned surface vessels or unmanned air vehicles to provide them with logistics to inspect their platforms? I mean, I, I don't think the big oil companies don't know what they don't know. So you have to give them a solution. Yes, ma'am. So the question is what the connection between the helicopter industry and the drone industry. In my perspective before they answer is, so the military helicopters think that we, me, since I was a big proponent of UAVs for the Navy, that I'm trying to put them out of business. That's not true. I'm trying to provide a supplemental, complementary capability for them so they don't have to go do the dull, dirty, dangerous stuff. As far as funding goes, at least within the military, that's a sticky wicket because there's program offices. There's a PMA 260 something or other just for helicopters. Then there is one for Navy UAVs, PMA 266. So they each have their own pots of money, and they each have requirements that they are trying to satisfy from the CNO's staff. And I think it's very similar with the other services. As far as industry goes, I don't, well, I mean, you may have a valid point. Um, for example, they're using heavy lift up in, up in Oregon. One of the companies up there is doing lifting logs taking from the forest back to the processing plants. So is that putting the helicopter out of business? No, well, maybe. But so, so getting cross-funding is probably not, not very palatable for a lot of folks, particularly if they think they're, that you're trying to steal their job. How I could so? touch on that too, Dave. What? I could touch on that too. Actually, right. Skylift would love to partner with a Bell and Ericsson, or you know, uh, even Blackhawks now are being used for 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 Cal Fire purposes. Because to your point, yeah, it does supplement it. It's something that a helicopter doesn't do. Secondly, it's because of our technology specifically at Skylift. Uh, we have a unique rotor head configuration that combines the utility of a helicopter with the cost advantage and the simplicity of of your commercial consumer drone. 
Uh, and that unique rotor head configuration is what allows us to have the lift efficiency we have. So this is probably something that would be interest uh, of, of interest to a company like Bell, Boeing, uh, Sikorsky, Ericsson that already provide uh, helicopters and helicopter services to the firefighting market. Um, so uh, along that line, if from the DOD perspective, that's probably not going to you're not going to get much cooperation. But on the private side. So pick one, Bell. If we can, if the UAV industry can provide an asset, the cost per flight hour for a UAV, I guarantee you, is significantly less than it is for a helicopter. So if if we can get our foot in the door and say, hey, because you have a good idea, let's work with you, Mr. Helicopter, and we can provide you some supplements. We can reduce your administrative overhead. You don't need as many pilots we can be more efficient, then there may be an opportunity for some synergy, and hopefully with that synergy comes some money. So that's a good point. Biggest manufacturing challenge. Challenge. I don't make anything. Ours at Citadel right now is just how fast can we turn around components or units. Um, demand is really high. Um, and the challenge you get on the supply chain when you're talking volumes of, call it, you know, 50 to 100 units, uh, it's t a difficult supply chain, an economic market for economic market for electronics at this time. So long lead time items. Um, I know specifically our strategy around kind of mitigating it is partnering with a you know, distributor supplier as well as an integrator on the manufacturing side. Um, so you get a little bit more of economies of scale. But right now our biggest challenge is reducing the lead time on parts and then cranking out units as fast as possible while managing our cash flow as a startup. And Chris, tell the audience how many companies are out there trying to do counter drone stuff. Yeah, so right now there's 255, of which about, you know, I'd say about, I don't know, 25% of those directly compete in the same space, same space that we are. Chad, do you have any manufacturing? Well, to help with manufacturing, we, we partner with a manufacturing partner to help us, you know, volume manufacture at scale. Um, and that way we don't have to invest heavily in machinery and you know, bring it on in, in more employees for that. But as far as a challenge goes, we're, we're targeting the DOD and you really have to be careful with where you source your components, especially electronic components. It has to be made in the United States and for 99% of you know, what you put into a drone. Um, batteries and propellers right now aren't really a big concern, but um, just trying to compete in this space and, and stay at an you know, attractive price point, it's, it's a challenge. It's always a dynamic challenge to keep that, um, that price point as low as possible so that you're ahead of the customer. Dave, manufacturing? Yeah, it's a pain. Um, <laughs> no question about it. Uh, I, I don't think it's probably any different in this industry as it is in, in any industry that has both hardware and software combining to, to um, perform a job. Perhaps what's different is that there are a lot of small drone companies doing really innovative things and small companies just naturally struggle to produce hardware. Um, it's, it's a really hard thing. You know, our board of directors constantly tries to tell us to stop building hardware. Um, and, you know, we, we do what we can. Supply chain is a big part of it. Um, finding good partners is a big part of it. There's not a single solution, but um, yeah, yeah, just just fighting through it. You know, leveraging as much uh, of other people's technologies you can, finding people who can do the things you need um, and can do it well, and you know, work together, collaboration. Um, Amir, you got any manufacturing challenges? Yeah, they've addressed it pretty well, and I think we had other questions if we're short on time. Okay. What is the prognosis for the workforce pipeline? to meet the current challenges and needs? Well, like I said, there's a lot of um, academic schools that are starting up their own UAV programs. Um, Emory Riddle has a very big one, University of North Dakota, University of Kansas, uh, lots of in Texas. They're all over the place, really. And so I think the workforce can be developed. The biggest challenge I see associated with that is how are we going to place all those people that have done all the hard work, gotten their degrees, where are we going to put them? I mean, 
there's places to put them, but we have to have some mechanism to connect the graduates that have these technical degrees and get them into companies that can use, use their skill sets. Just anybody else want to add to that? No? I'll give a quick plug for Maricosta College, who has a, uh, a technical engineering program um, where they're training people specifically to be able to do um, electromechanical systems and um, you know, spin out rapidly and be really useful for companies like us. And if you want to know more about that, talk to this young lady over here. She'll be glad to help. Yes, sir. Is there any drone delivery system that's up and running? They've delivered pizza, beer. What else do you want? Zipline yeah. delivers uh, fresh blood and vaccines in Africa, mm -hmm. um, and they do it quite quite effectively. Uh, in the states, yeah, Flirty I that's working with, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Hospitals are better equipped here, so they tend to have blood and vaccines. But and most certainly, but Dr. Bryan has a plan. What What are the biggest gaps is out in the rural areas? How long does it take an ambulance to get out there? I think we can get a drone out there a lot quicker. So in the US, we are behind, most certainly, in the logistics delivery mission. And until the FAA comes up with, I mean, it needs to be beyond line of sight. I mean, if it's next door, the, the paramedic can run across the street just as quickly as the drone can get there. Uh, I think the Postal Service has, in fact, done some tests where they've put a drone on top of their mail vehicles. They load the mail, and then they send the drones out. But that's only been in a test. They're not doing that in, in practical It's all still in development. UPS has done the same. Precision mapping solutions? Can we do that? So, so typically for that application, you're talking about needing an RTK GPS system. Um, so we're working with a Fortune 100 company that's wanting to do uh, a lot of mapping and inspections and needing extreme precision during that entire process. And there's, there's typically two types of RTK GPSs. I don't know if you know if that, what that is. It's actually, so with a typical quad rotor, uh, you need a GPS on the drone so that you're, you have navigation. You're flying around. It knows where it is. If you let off the sticks, it's just going to hover there. But um, it's, it's only so accurate. It's got about a three meter accuracy on average. Uh, RTK GPS is where you have a GPS on the ground. As they call it usually a, a you know, GPS puck on, on the ground. You also have one on the drone. And there's correction data that's being sent between the ground GPS and the, and the drone GPS. And it's able to actually do corrections on, on the reading that's coming from the sensors so that they can do these very, very accurate missions. But if you don't have the ground puck, does... There's still some other opportunities. Uh, there is data that you can actually log into th now through uh, LTE. You can actually go through, like a company like Swift Navigation has a, a subscriber service where you can log in and you can get cellular correction data coming in onto the aircraft uh, to actually accomplish that, that mission. Some of the bigger companies particularly have developed map overlays. So they lay one map on top of another, and that helps reduce, I'm not it's probably better than three meters, but I mean, there's some fairly accurate systems out there, to, like within two inches. That's two inches. Right. That, that, that most certainly is doable. Don't ask me to give you a name. Oh. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we definitely. I mean, let me put it in the, in the context of an application for us, right? We need to know where the firefighters are, where the fuel is on the ground. Uh, what the weather condition is in a specific location because all of that affects a wildfire. So absolutely, it's, Im it's important to us to have that mapping solution. And in fact, right now, we're talking to a variety of different companies and academic institutions to find the right ones. It looks like it's going to have to be a combination because just like any of us, the, they have to specify the niche or they have to actually focus, narrow their focus on a specific type of mission or use. Uh, to improve their technology on the mapping solution, right? So if we don't come to them with, hey, this is a specific need that we have, uh, what they, the solution they may have right now probably isn't good for us. Well, and, and there's a military application, too. If you're doing precision targeting, you need to be very accurate on where you're going to put that weapon because you don't want any collateral damage. But, I mean, you bring up a good point. We have time for one more question, I think. 
So his question is collaboration with the industry. What's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, right now, because it's a top priority within DOD, we're getting a lot of collaboration from big primes. Um, it's kind of nice being the bell at the ball. Right? It's something that you know hasn't necessarily yielded enough of an economic return for big primes to look at it. Um, so now that you know the industry is opening up, every big prime that's out there and probably any mid-sized defense company has has contacted us. Um, so we see a lot of collaboration on that side. Um, some of them are also taking it a little bit internal, but the government's getting a little bit more savvy with spending where you know, a big prime can't come in and say, we want to develop a system over five years and it's going to cost you $100 million and you're not going to see anything until year four. Uh, so now when some of those opportunities are presented where the big prime has a seat at the table, they come down to you know, the, the, the smaller, younger, more nimble company. Um, and that's, that's us at this point in time where we're able to help. But even I think cross industry, um, you're also seeing it. So uh, you know, anytime there's a, like an inflection point in an industry, you see a lot of consolidation or partnership for growth. Um, and I think we're seeing it on the counter drone side, and I imagine the commercial side seeing it just as much. So the 725 exhibitors up in Denver last month, over seven, 8,000 attendees. My observation, my two cents worth is, the smaller, co the bigger companies aren't so keen on collaboration. The Lockheed, Boeing's, North, I don't have anything against those guys. They've done some great work. But those bigger companies have a large enough capacity and bandwidth and funding that they can say, okay, you go develop your counter drone thing. That, that's okay. You just keep on going. But we're not overly interested. Where I see the opportunity for a lot more collaboration is with the small to mid sized companies. That way they can pool resources and collaborate a little bit more and come up and do, especially when funding becomes a big issue. If you can pull a couple of pots of money together, okay, you develop the sensor, I'll develop the, the vehicle, the truck, and, and we can work together. And I think that, that, is, that goes on a lot more at the mid to lower levels. I, I would echo that. I mean, we work with uh, unmanned boat companies, uh, USVs, unmanned surface vehicles, and uh, unmanned ground vehicles as well. Because you know, by combining these systems, you get more bang for your buck. We we also work with bigger companies too, but it's usually when there's a customer pull on the other end. Um, so the customer is saying, "Hey, I want you to work with Plank. I want Plank stuff on your vehicle, for example." Um, that's where we get success there. But we, I think collaborative, we share a lot of. Stuff. I think the only change that at least we're seeing on this side, where it's I think a little bit unique and probably new to 2018, on the big prime defense side. You need to think that there was billions of dollars spent on legacy assets that now need to be repurposed because the government's like, okay, we made a stupid investment. We can't do anything with it. Now you need to make our technology smart. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing is when you look, you know, 10, now 12 years ago with the IED issue, they have a bunch of jamming equipment. That jamming equipment isn't smart enough to now detect UAV. Fortunately, they've spent you know a little over three to you know four billion dollars on that. So it opens up an opportunity where they need now to keep their program of record and stay relevant. They need to introduce new technology and innovation, and that's where we're actually getting a lot of our market entry. So back to your question on logistics, the Army has a system called Big Dog, Google Big Dog. It's basically a pack mule. They are using that in the U.S., but they're not delivering blood with it. I mean, they use it to haul stuff so the troops don't have to carry 100 pounds of packs on the back. I would like to thank the panel. Once again, thank Kanabi Martin and MIT.